Man, good morning. How many of y'all got floated away over the weekend? <laughs> Been crazy rainstorms, but you know, it's either feast or famine in Houston, isn't it? I do want you to know that the message today is age appropriate, which means if you have children probably younger than uh, 10, you might want to move them to a safe zone. <laughs> I am talking about some issues uh, that are pre pre prevalent and relevant today in regard to purity and morality. In fact, we'll be doing this for the next several Sundays, uh, talking about issues that are plaguing our culture and our nation. I think it's time that uh, we raise a voice and let it be heard very loud and very clear that there's still a God in heaven and He has not changed. From the first of Genesis to the end of Revelation, He will not change. Nor in time, nor anywhere in eternity will He change His mind. He is God on high. He has established a set of laws and principles that will forever be the same. So I want you to know today what we share is not anybody's personal opinion. It is the Word of God. And we'll be talking about that. And we'll discover as we talk about this topic today that the Word of God perhaps is not relevant to the culture we live in anymore. But it's still relevant. It's still real. It still changes lives. God is still performing marvelous and grand things in people's lives who are willing to hear truth and believe truth. But when it comes to issues of morality, this whole issue of, uh, of having purity and virtue, virginity, these things that the culture has somehow lost view of, uh, those are the things we'll be talking about. Every great nation that has fallen, as you can study through history, has usually fallen and always fallen through the mor moral decay that happens within that nation. You just read history and you discover it very clearly. Every nation is destroyed from within first. The moral fiber goes, then everything else goes. Because with virtue, with morality, also comes strength. That's why the scripture has so much to say on it. And from the book of Genesis on to the end of the Bible, there's a great deal to say on it. But we're living in a world that really doesn't pay a lot of attention to scripture. We know that as Christians. And it does listen more to what is coming out of the media. No matter what part of the world the media might be presenting itself, they pretty much all embrace the same philosophy, of humanism, uh, the things that are, uh, of, of what's important is what I can feel and what I can hear, what I can taste, what I can see. Completely lost sight of the fact that there is a God, there's a spirit world, there's a God who loves us, there are angels, there are demons, there's a Satan who hates us and wants to destroy our lives. But we're going to take everything we do from the, from the Word of God. Unfortunately, the culture listens to the media. I just pulled some statistics, and there's thousands of things that we could talk about today to verify the reality of the moral degradation, the moral decay that our nation is facing, the world is facing. But these came off a government website, an educational website, by the way, and they made references to other statistical studies. I just watched it, can't do a thing with it. But uh, they make reference to a lot of other studies that are relevant that are out there. But uh, one of the things that kind of popped out of all these per particular studies that I was looking at is the, the, the power of media and especially of television. Uh, this is one of the statements made. Americans will spend about one-third of their free time. Now catch this. A lot of things we can do in our free time. Americans will spend one-third of their free time, and that is more than the next ten most popular leisure activities combined. All right? They'll spend one-third of their leisure time watching television. The average teenager spends more time in front of a television than any other activity besides sleeping. So you wonder what's wrong with young America. They're either sleeping or watching TV. That's pretty much the way it all really boils down to. Television viewing increases in preteen years and declines after 12. Adolescents from 9 to 14 will spend 20% of their waking hours watching television. And the study goes on, but that gets down to this point. By the time a teenager reaches 18, they will have seen over 350,000 commercials. And one-third of them, 100,000 of those commercials, will have been advertisements for drinking, for beer. Now, you never see a bunch of old people used in beer commercials, do you? You know, I saw a study this week says, you know, drinking wine will improve your health. I said, well, they need to go down to the bridge down here and ask those guys how it's working. Yeah, and that's another sermon we'll say for another time. And then it gets into the issue of morality and sexual content on television. Two out of every three shows on TV include sexual content. It's a majority, by the way, all right? An increase from about half the shows from 1997 and 98. Now these shows will include, more shows than ever include sexual content. The most widely viewed shows, those are airing in prime time on the major networks, are even more likely to include sexual content. 
Went on to say sexual intercourse is depicted are strongly implied in one out of every 10 shows on TV. Of those instances of the intercourse, either depicted or strongly implied, only half will occur among couples who've established with an established relationship with one another. Now, what does an established relationship mean? That doesn't mean in the context of the world is married, all right? It might mean they've been living together, they've been dating for a long time. Uh, it's, we've lost the context of, of what, this, what a meaningful relationship is. You know, young people listen very carefully. Let me give you a one-word definition of a meaningful relationship. Married. Amen. Say on. The Bible says in, in marriage, the bed is undefiled. So marriage is the context that Scripture gives this and why God gave this gift to a man and woman to be, in, to, to be experienced in a relationship of marriage. I tell my kids, sex before marriage, the Bible makes it clear, is sin. After marriage, knock your lights out. Be married first. With your marriage partner, by the way. Amen? And this goes on and on. It's just amazing it's, how many of these statistics show that uh, how, in, how it's increased, immorality has increased, and sexual content has increased, and even to the point of sexual content that involves teenagers. Just a few years ago, only 3% of the shows that were on TV, at least in primetime, would deal with that issue about teen involvement, but that has jumped to 9% now of TV shows. And, of course, it's never depicted in the context of... Uh, of uh, uh, STDs, HIV, AIDS, you know, and all those things, it's usually depicted in something like, well, we have a meaningful relationship, which doesn't mean married to them. According to a study prepared for the Kaiser Family Foundation, 50 hours of programming select, included 150 acts of sexual intercourse and only five references within those three episodes to contraceptions or safe sex or the mention of HIV or AIDS referred to. And, and the only mention of HIV referred to contracting HIV through an IV drug, not sexual activity. We wonder why we're so stupid and why we're so diseased in the culture that we're living in. Of course, the media has so much to, to play in all this. We've said it for years. In fact, there are studies now that prove the fact that how people and how much people view the media will affect their behavior. In fact, here's what the study said. There are strong theoretical reasons to believe that the media play, may play an especially important role in the socialization of sexual knowledge, attitudes, and behavior. Health topics in, in entertainment te television shows can increase your viewers' awareness of important health issues. In a study of 13 and 14-year-olds, heavy exposure to sexually oriented television increased the acceptance of non-marital sex. We're talking about 13, 14-year-olds. In other words, they're establishing a worldview and a philosophy that is anti-God, anti-Bible, anti-Christ in regards to this particular part of their life and it's really one of the most important parts of their life in which God has much to say to young people as well as adults about. But yet we have adults who won't take the time to tell their children what, what the Bible does say. We have adults who still believe that their kids only watch on television what they tell them to watch when they're away from the house. You aren't one of those, are you? You really believe that your children are not going to watch something you tell them not to watch when you leave the house or you go on to a trip or something like that. They're going to do exactly what, you, what, what is there and what they can watch. I would say even more so today, if we have children in the home, we said our granddaughter over this week, we didn't even turn the television on unless we watched Barney or something, you know. That was about it, a children's show. Because there's so much content that is so harmful because it, and it's harmful because it, it gets them to receive a concept, an idea, a principle, a life philosophy, again, that is contrary to what the Bible teaches. And I have pages and pages of, of this kind of material that just goes on and on. It talks about in the same study, the Kaiser Institute said 76% of teens said that one reason young people have sex is because TV shows and movies make it just seem normal for teens. It's just the accepted behavior. Now, I know this might shock some of you, but this didn't start just in the last decade. This has been going on since the 60s in TV. I mean, happy days with the funds, you know. It's all about, you know, it's having activity and relationships and boyfriends and girlfriends and making out and all those things because it starts somewhere, all right? It starts with more than just a handshake, by the way. Another study went on to say that viewing of daytime serials and MTV is the pre predicator of sexually permissive attitudes and behavior among students today. In other words, we see it on TV, it must be everybody's doing, and it's acceptable. That's the way that the world wants you to think. That's the way the, the, the agenda of the world wants you to think. And the fact that, you know, media becomes a, a tool of education and information for young people, and it's not a good tool 
of education and information for young people. Today we're going to be talking about specifically, and there's a lot we can talk about. We're going to be taking four, five, six weeks as we go through this, about purity and why it's so important. And where, how do we walk in purity in our spiritual lives and the power of purity? I think a lot of people really don't understand what it means to be a pure person. The scriptures, as I've said earlier, has a great deal to say about this issue of virtue and purity in our life. And this particular topic alone could really take weeks and weeks and weeks to develop because a lot of people don't understand what virtue is. We talk about the virtuous woman and adding faith, and virtue your faith, and we use the term loosely and lightly. But I think you see the, the personification of virtue probably in an Old Testament character as a young man, you see David. And he was a young man of wisdom. He was, a, he was just a young boy, all right, of wisdom, of strength. He had character because he, he was in the Word of God and the Word of God was in him and he loved God with all his heart. He focused on the things of God. And when it came to a time of great conflict, when every adult failed to stand up, this young man stepped up, this young boy stepped up and conquered the giant. Where did all this faith come from? Where did this integrity and power, what did it lead to, this virtue in his life? It led to great anointing on his life and great power on his life. And if you want to experience that kind of power in your life, then you need to walk with God. Here's some scriptures from 1 Thessalonians, and this will be the basis of what we speak from today. He says here, Finally then, brethren... We request and exhort you in the Lord Jesus that as you have received from us instruction as to how you ought to walk and please God, just as you actually do walk, that you excel still more. For you know what commandments we gave you by the authority of the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that is, that you abstain from sexual immorality, and that each of you know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor. Not in lustful passion like Gentiles who do not know God. And that no man transgress and defraud his brother in this matter because the Lord is the avenger in all these things. Just as we told you before and solemnly warned you. God has not called us for the purpose of impurity. He's called us in sanctification. So he who rejects this is not rejecting man but the God who gives his Holy Spirit to you. Now as to the love of the brethren you have no need for anyone to write to you for you yourselves are taught by God to love one another. So here we have a word from the apostle, one of many, because almost every book in the Bible deals with these particular issues of purity. It talks about passion. It talks about what do we do with our bodies. Now, again, it's been, a, it's been a subject that has been ignored many, many times. I think in youth groups, we, we've always taught these, these topics and these principles and youth groups and things. But it has to be taught in the homes. And then it has to be lived out in them. You just can't tell your children, don't do something, and then turn the TV on and sit there and be entertained by those who are doing what you just told your children not to do. That means say amen. <laughs> that means say a little louder. You don't say amen because some of you are doing that, all right? And because whether it's out of ignorance or just rebellion, it's happening in your heart and life. And no wonder studies show today that 55 to 60 percent of Christian young people, not lost of it, Christian young people are sexually active. And although the majority of young people who are in church today who claim to be Christians will say virginity is a very important thing in life and, and the Bible says that we should be this way until we're married, you know, and, and you know, we, we believe it's important, they tell us but only 14% of those young people will remain that way till they're married. And you talk to a lot of young people today and they have excuses. Well, everybody else is doing it. It's so acceptable. It's a common norm upon our culture. And if you're a virgin, people are going to laugh at you. They might make fun of you. So, you know, I don't want to be left out. I want to be like everybody else. Well, friends, that's not the goal of our life, to be like everybody else. The goal of our life is to stand out, not to be the same. We're living in a day and age which is not any different from the past days and age where everybody wants to be cloned, to be accepted by the group, to be received and to be popular and to be one of the particular group, whatever the group might be. It's not just with young people, it's with adults as well. We, we want to be liked at work, we want to be accepted at work, we want to be recognized at work, we want people to receive us. And therefore, because we want people to receive us, we have to be very cautious about what we would say or, view, or letting our, our opinions be aired. And so what happens is you get the little stamp of approval from the world and you become just like everybody else. God didn't intend you. God made you unique. Now, the problem is we've told our children from the time they're one in this generation we're living in that they're special. Everybody wins a trophy. Everybody gets a ribbon. Everybody's special. No, you're not. 
You're not special, okay? You have to live a righteous life. You have to, you have to achieve something if you really want to be. You know, I think of somebody, Billy Graham's special. Amen? I think he's special. There's some people who've achieved great things in life and done great things for mankind and great things for humanity. You know what? They're special. You, you're sitting on the couch watching 20 hours of TV a week. There's nothing special about that. I know this offends somebody in your particular philosophy, but, you know, you're not special, all right? You're a little sinner until you get saved. And then you can start being something special because you know God, because you commit your life to Christ, because you're going with God. And so speciality can start being something you can pursue with purpose in your life to do something for the glory of God, to make a difference. But you won't make a difference if you're trying to be like everybody else. It's not going to happen. God wants something unique to take place in your life. It's called virtue, moral standards, purity, holiness, righteousness. Somebody that's different from the rest of the world who's willing to pay the price and to do something for the glory and the honor of God. And Peter wrote to the, to the church, he said, you should give all diligence to add to your faith virtue. Now he lists about seven, eight, nine things there I think that he talks about we should add to our... So in other words, when you get saved, you add these, these characteristics, these, these, these values to your life. And as you add them, then your life's going to be fruitful and meaningful. But the very first thing he puts on the list, and if you go through Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, right on down to Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, all the way through, you're going to find out that the Bible keeps bringing you back to this. If you're going to be a believer that makes a difference in the world for God, if you want some value to your life, then what you've got to do is you've got to focus on this issue, add to your faith virtue. And it's more than just, we say, well, it's kind of something honorable. No, when virtues in our life, basically the power and the presence of God are profound in our life. And we be those kind of people who people listen to, who make a difference. Now, when you go back to 1 Thessalonians, there's about five simple principles that are given to us here where he talks about making a difference, you know, and how to make a difference in your life and really how for God to do something unique in your life. So let's go through this. First thing he mentions here in talking about regards to their spiritual walk in life is is, is purpose. You know, will you be a person of purpose? And so it's his, in fact, he tells us what the purpose is. Furthermore, then, brethren, we beseech you by the... We exhort you by the Lord Jesus Christ that as you have received of us how you ought to walk and to please God, you would abound more and more. So what he's talking about here is that you would have a life, you would have a walk that is meaningful, that is abounding. First of all, he says, what does God want from you? He wants a walk. He wants you to have a walk, a walk with him, a walk that is genuine, not just on a Sunday, not just when your Christian friends are around, not just when the wife's there or when mom and dad are around, but you, you have your own real walk with God. There has to come a place in your life where you discover God for yourself, all right? When you start living for Jesus, not just because mom and daddy like it, all right, but because you're genuine, that you're real. And so a walk, and what happens is that he said, I want you to know how to walk with God, and I want you to know how to please God. That ought to be the cry and drive of every person in this room that says they know Christ. There's a, there's a heart in us that says, I want to please God. And the Bible tells us how we can please God. It talks about how faith pleases God. It talks about how worship pleases God. It, our relationship with God is primary and first and most important. That's pleasing to God. Now, what happens when my walk is right with God and I'm seeking to please God, by the way, that's my purpose and your purpose, to bring glory to God. That's what it all boils down to. That's the aim, okay, of my life is to walk with God and to bring pleasure to God. What happens? As I do that, then God begins to do a work in me where I begin to abound, I begin to be full. I begin to experience completion. I understand what it means to live with freedom in my life, not binding enslavement in my life. I understand what it means to live with power of God on my life. I understand what it means to have some strength of character in my life. And I am in the dark, what I am in the light, you know. It's just I'm, I'm walking with God. And what God does in me is he brings forth fruit. He brings forth fullness and success in the truest biblical sense, not this success of achievement in the world, the success of knowing I'm full, I'm happy, I'm holy, I'm walking with God. He said, this is what God wants you to do. That's the purpose. This is what we ought to do. I exhort you by the Lord Jesus. I told you, you received us, how you can walk and you can please God. Why? So you can abound more and more. More and more. So how can I do that? Well, first of all, this is your purpose. And then he gives you a plan for doing it. Simply written in scriptures, he talks about, you know, for, in verse 5, this is the will of God, your sanctification. What's he doing here? 
He's showing us what, what, what the purpose is as well as what the plan is. He said, I want you to understand God's will. You must understand God's will. In fact, that's probably one of the biggest questions in speaking to people one-on-one -on -one that I deal with as a pastor. Brother John, I really want to know what God's will is. Is this the person I'm supposed to marry? Is this the job I'm supposed to take? Is this the steps of action? Am I supposed to be in the ministry? Am I supposed to do this? What, what's God's will in all this? Well, good to know that God wants you to know his will. Amen? And, and, and Paul is saying, hey, first of all, it's to, it's to walk with God and please God. Period. First point. All right? And if you, as you do that, you'll abound more and more. So now I'm going to be more specific, says. So now I'm going to tell you what the will of God is. For everyone here today who's been wanting to know the will of God for your life, listen carefully. For this is the will of God, your sanctification. Sanctification. That's a big word, I know. Now, if you go to any recent kind of church growth seminary where pastors by the thousands are gathered to learn how to have a big church then you'll learn not to use these kind of words, sanctification. Because people don't understand these words. I want to stand up at that point and say, that's why you're called to preach! <laughs> so they can't understand. Amen. But yet we've dumbed down the congregations in the world today, all right? We have a bunch of spiritual illiterates running around. You talk about sanctification. Well, that's a big word, you know. That's sanctification. What are you? Well, I mean, it's, it's, it's simple. If it's the will of God, then certainly we all understand the purpose and the plan of God, you know, is that, that, that he would, it would be my sanctification. You, you know, you, if, if, if you don't know what God's will is, mark it down. God wants me to walk in sanctification. Let's all say it together. Sanctification. Try it one more time. Sanctification. All right? And so that's, that's the plan. This is God's will. But to do that, you know, there's a process that God works in our life. And sanctification is something we do need to understand. There's really three stages to it. When you give your life to Jesus, you are sanctified according to 1 Corinthians. You're made right with God. All right? This word has to do with cleansing, being made right, being made acceptable in God's sight. Well, why would I not be acceptable? Well, God is holy. All right? He is offended by sin. And we are sinners in our very core being. So that when I come to Jesus, he changes me in what I am and he sanctifies me. I'm a sinner, so I now receive Jesus, I'm saved, and sanctification happens in my life where he makes me clean. Now there's another part, not just this positional sanctification, there's progressive sanctification. I have been saved, all right, and where I was sanctified. But now today, God wants me to be being, being sanctified. How do you do that? Well, that's that walking with God. That's where you walk each day and you put off the old man, you put on the new man. That's where you say no to self and no to sin and yes to Jesus. And you start, the Bible says, it calls it this way, you grow in grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's sanctification in progressive mode. You're becoming more like Jesus Christ. The Bible says in Ephesians 5, 22, Husbands, love your wives, just like Christ loved the church. He gave himself up to her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with the water through the word, and to present himself as a, to, as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. What's he saying? Jesus Christ is constantly at work in your life to make you holy, to sanctify you. And why does he do that? Because he loves us. So if we love our wives, then we'll take the word of God and we'll minister the word of God to them because that's what changes their lives it's the same way it changes our lives. He says, you, you husbands, live with your wives this way by loving them, ministering the word. That, so there's, there's a positional, progressive. And the third is the ultimate sanctification. sanctification. Now that's attained when we are made completely right with God in the fullest, complete sense. The apostle put it this way in 1 John. He said, listen, when we see him, we're going to be made like him. And this corruption will put on incorruption. And this mortality will put on immortality. What's going to happen? I am going to be completely holy, sanctified, inside, outside, all sides, upside, downside. Amen? Made just like Jesus. In a moment, in the twinkling of the, bio, of the eye, the Bible says, made right with God completely. So I, I was saved back 100 years ago. I mean, 1973. Some of y'all can't count that far, okay? In 1973, I was saved. I, and when I was saved, I was sanctified in my heart, made right with God. Now, step two is, God wants me growing in grace, sanctification and process, becoming more like Jesus daily, knocking off all the stuff in me that doesn't look like Jesus, act like Jesus, smell like Jesus, talk like Jesus. God wants to clean that up, all right? 
So that's progressive. And there's the ultimate, whether by death or rapture, we'll be made like Christ because we've already been accepted in his sight as his beloved. Praise the Lord. So that's sanctification. He says right here, it's God's will for you to be sanctified. What's the will of God for my life? Sanctification. And he gives you some aspects or, 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 or two things that need to happen in your life. And he's talking specifically now about some sexual sins that are prominent within the church at this time. There's two aspects of this sanctification that it starts. This is just the starting place, all right? He used this first thing. He said that every one of you should know how to abstain you know, from sanctification. It's the word apeko. It's two words, a negative little part, a at the first, the participle, attached to another word, pesho, which means to have. So if it's a, like atheist, someone without God, all right, it's a peko, a pesho, whichever it is, it basically means to, to, to keep away from something or to take away from something or to hold yourself away from something. The more simpler terminology for this in regard to sexual sins, premarital sexual sins, adultery, homosexuality, or any of these other moral sins he's talking about in regard to our physical being and our bodies, he says, abstain. The other word would be flee. Flee fornication. Flee adultery. Flee homosexuality. Every sexual sin, the way we deal with it is one way. We run. Run. Flee. Boogie, whatever you mean by it, get out of there. I mean, it's, 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 you've heard me use the term before. You, if you're on a diet, you don't stand and stare at the refrigerator. He said, I'm not going to get in there. I'm not going to do that. I have made a pledge. I've got wearing a ring. I'm not going to get in there. I'm not going to do that. I'm not, maybe a little peek. Oh, look in there. <laughs> but it looks so good. And God wants me to be happy. And there you find yourself in deep trouble all of a sudden because you didn't take the simplest of all instructions. The simplest instruction is what? Get out of there. Abstain. He says here, abstain from fornication is the word it uses in the King James. It basically means sexual immorality. And fornication, so many times people think of it as just premarital sexual relationships, you know, prior to marriage. But this is the word which goes way beyond that. It means all sexual sins. Pornuo is the Greek word, all right? We get the word porn from it. All sexual immorality, run, flee. Someone said, this kind of sin is a blast that will not last, all right? It's a thrill that will eventually kill. Satan's goal is to destroy your life, and if he can do it, he will do it. So what God say? Stay away from it. Just don't, don't go there. Don't spend time there. Don't start looking there. Don't start thinking there. The first thing your mind needs to say in regard to that temptation, sorry. Not happening. I'm going somewhere else. You're not going to toy around. You're not going to think around. You're not going to play around. You're not going to put yourself in situations where you'll be caught in trouble. You're just going to stay away from it. Now, the positive side, that's it's kind of like two sides of a coin, a positive side and a negative side. The positive side is that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor. You know what that means? It means you should know how to control. You should know how to manage. That's what this word possess means. You need to know how to manage your body in a way that brings glory to God. When you read through Romans chapter 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, those verses in there, he gets into some stuff about your body. He talks about the bodies for the Lord. We should give glory to God with our body. Why? The body's the temple of the Holy Spirit. God lives in you. Present your body a living sacrifice. There's a lot of scripture about your body and the stewardship of your body and responsibility you have to be a good steward over your body. You have to make right choices and real choices and reasonable spiritual choices. You have to believe what God says and obey what God says. That's management. That's stewardship. God's given you this body to bring glory. But what happens when I bring glory to God? God brings life and abundance and fullness and reality of life to me. So he says, you should know how to possess your vessel. I'm always intrigued when somebody comes and says, you know, oh, Bob, he really ruined himself for drinking. You know, drinking just destroyed his life or drugs just really ruined her. No, she ruined her. Bob ruined Bob because he chose to do that. But everybody wants to blame some, you know, something out there. Let's don't take responsibility. It's my parents' fault. It's the educational system. It's the world to live in. It's the way I was raised. My dad ran off when I was three years old and on and on and it goes. We want to blame everybody instead of taking personal responsibility. 
Well, as a Christian, God has given you responsible place of authority in your life to do what needs to be done with your body as he wants you to do it. So you possess your vessel. Now, there's a passage where Peter's talking later on into the church about possessing your vessel in honor. And it has a dual meaning in that passage. One is it, it has to do with possessing your wife. My wife is my vessel. She's me and me is she. All right. We are one. You see her, you see me, you see me, you see her. God made us one. It was a miracle that took place when we made a pledge to one another to be each other's other part. And so we are one. So, so in one instance, when Paul's talking about possess your vessel in honor and sanctification, he goes on in verse seven, uh, chapter uh, 3, 1 Peter, and he says, Likewise, husbands, dwell with your wife according to knowledge and give honor to the wife as unto the weaker vessel. All right? she's, your, she's, the, she's the vessel. So for me to possess my vessel in sanctification and honor means I'm to be a righteous husband whose eyes are only for my wife, whose life is only for my wife, whose body is only for my wife, I, and I put, I, she's part of me, and I will honor her, all right? The word honor is a, is a Greek word, teammate, and we spell it time, T-I-M-E, but it's teammate, and it means to, to honor, to place value. And as a man, if you're going to honor your wife, it means that you, you place tremendous value upon her. You realize how important she is to you. You realize how, hey, she's the only one, by the way, whom you can enjoy a physical relationship with without guilt. The only one. Without shame. Without dishonor. Without embarrassment. Without ruin. She's the only one. So he's saying here, you know, you need to understand the value of your wife, but that's just one little aspect. There's much more value than that. In other words, it's, 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 you realize just how important she is and how valuable she is to your life, and you realize that your marriage is to be honorable. It's the same kind of word when the Bible says, you know, that in marriage the bed is undefiled in the book of Hebrews chapter 13. He said it, 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 that's part of that word, you know, in, in marriage the bed is honorable, is what the good translation would be. It's valuable. It's the word timios from that same word. So there's dual meaning. One, as a married man, it's my, it's, it's my wife and my relationship. Protect it, honor it. As a single person, it would be you possess your vessel, your body. You manage your body in honor. 1 Corinthians 6, 13 says there's meats for the belly, belly for meats, but God's going to destroy both, both of them. Now, the body is not for fornication, any sexual sin, but the body is for the Lord, and the Lord is for the body. The Bible says, we have this treasure in earthen vessels, in this body. I, I, I have this treasure. Now, God has given me something the day I was born and created in my mother's womb as, as well as he gave you. He gave you certain desires, all right? There's just things you, 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 you long. One is food. Anybody here not like food? Yeah. We, we, we have a desire to eat. It's a natural, normal, God-given drive, right? Now, you can, you can sin against God by, you can become anorexic or bulimic or whatever, or gluttonous on the other hand, all right? And what are you doing? If you commit those sins, then you're, 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 you're really sinning against your own body, aren't you? All right? So you, that's a drive. There's also an, another, there's a drive that God has given all of us, I believe, to worship. And man's going to worship something. He's going to worship himself. He's going to worship idols or he's going to worship God. But he's going to seek to satisfy that drive and that desire somewhere. God put it in every man, I believe in his righteousness to seek God. Some will say no, some will reject God, but ultimately God's given them, given them this drive to lead them to him. Now, there's also another drive. There's, in fact, there's many, I believe, and they kind of make up our life like fine woven twines in a, in a rope that makes up our life. And what God wants to do is, is sanctify those drives and desires, all right? So whatever they are, what, whatever, whatever in our life, that we do it in a God-honoring fashion, there's another one called the sex drive. God put that in every person, all right? There's this drive, there's this desire. But there's a righteous way to satisfy that, just like, just like every other drive. There's a right way and a wrong way to satisfy it. And God tells us what way that is to satisfy it, to deal with that. Verse 5 of 1 Corinthians talks about don't satisfy, or this verse 5, excuse me, in Thessalonians, not, do not satisfy these desires in the lust of concupiscence. That's what it says in the King James. Don't you like that word? Can't stay with that. It's a little slobber. In lust of concupiscence. Lasciviousness. You know what those words mean? No. That's because you, you probably had a preacher at some time in your life that dumbed you down, all right? <laughs> Lasciviousness, concupiscence. Concupiscence is a word which means the desire for something that's forbidden. Uh, I want you, and you want me. So what's the deal? Well, what's the deal is you're not married. What's the deal is not the right time, nor the right place, nor the right situation. 
It's a desire for something that you know that God has said for you not to have at this point in time in your life. In fact, this word concupiscence, when you study apostasy, apostasy are counterfeit Christians. All right? When you study apostasy and you study it from, from, from Genesis all the way through the June in Revelation, you'll see that apostate is someone who fell away from the truth. Not that they ever embraced it for their own selves, but they adhered to a form of godliness, all right? But they denied God in their life. And they have this fake religion. Oh, I love Jesus. You know, and you see this all the time with people say, well, I, you know, yeah, I'm living with so-and-so and I live, you know, live like a, you know, a, a immoral person and have immoral habits and I'm just, you know, kind of godless in all my behavior and my attitudes. But, oh, I love Jesus. I just can't wait to get to heaven to see him. Apostasy. One of the clear signs of an apostate is somebody who chooses to live in immorality and reject the standards of God for their life. They want to have a form of godliness, but they deny God's power in their life. You have to make decisions in your life to honor God with your body. Now, he gives you some practical steps to this. And what are the, the fourth point is these practical steps. So he says, so here's what you do. If you're really interested in, in, in purity and, and, and being what God wants and having the glory of God in your life, and he said, make sure that none of you go and transgress or step over those boundaries. The Greek word is huperbeno. It means to overstep a, a limitation that separates purity from impurity or chastity from, from, from impurity or, or licentiousness from righteousness. You know, there's a boundary out there. And God's drawn the line of where it, that is. Where are the boundaries? And, and what are the boundaries? You say, you know, uh, I'm coming up to this edge here, and there's a cliff down there. But, you know, I would really, I've seen some other people go over this cliff. So, I get, I, you know, and I heard him screaming all the way down. It must be thrilling. <laughs> but I know, I know I shouldn't step over that, but I'm going to step it over it anyway. You, you've also heard me use the illustration of when you take driver's education class and you finally take your driving test. And the cop gets in the car with you, and he's driving you around. And do they even do that anymore. All right, I didn't know that. <laughs> and now it's teachers probably. But if you come up to a stop sign, and you don't stop behind the sign, and most intersections today we have a white line, you know, right there at the stop sign. You're supposed to stop behind the white line. And for you to come up to the stop sign and go across the white line with your bumper, or even with your front tire, then you've stepped across the line, and you flunk the stop sign test. You're supposed to, that's why the line's there, by the way. You're supposed to stop behind the line. You could flunk the test. That's that word transgress. Don't overstep the line. There's a boundary. There's a line there. Don't, don't bail out over there. That's like Jesus saying, you know, there's, it's like a man cannot take fire into his bosom and not be burned. Why? Because fire goes in the fireplace, not your bosom. I'm going to say, well, that's a stupid illustration. I mean, can you imagine, here's Jesus say, a man cannot take fire into his bosom and not be burned. I'm sure there's some college kid out there saying, duh. <laughs> duh. That's kind of a dumb moment when you think about it. Why? Because fire was the most destructive force known to man at this time. There's nothing that could destroy you quicker and faster, more painfully than fire. God, through the Lord Jesus and through the prophets and through the Word of God, constantly comes coming back to this point. There's nothing more destructive to your physical life than sexual immorality. It's a powerful word, isn't it? It'll destroy you. It'll ruin you. It'll take your life. The Bible says that sin is a transgression of the law. What does that mean? God's gave a purpose at it. God's gave a plan at it. And for you to just ignore it and say, well, I don't care. I know what everybody else is doing. But you can get on TV and listen to everybody to call Christians fools and the Bible ridiculous. You've got guys like Bill Maher out there, you know, who laugh at Christianity, mock God and mock standards and mock morality. See what happens in the end. He says, don't cross those lines. He says, so how do you do it? Practical steps first. You should... Do not transgress those things, nor defraud. Plenecto is the word. Two words together, echo and pleon, meaning to have something, to take advantage of something. What's he saying here? Don't you go and sin in this regard, nor should you make anybody else go and sin in this regard. Don't you be the one who stumbles and then take somebody in the stumbling process with you. You got it, what he's saying here? Have a life that's righteous, but affects other people for righteousness. So he said, don't cause any, and use the word defraud. When we talk about those appetites and those drives, literally this word is a word which means don't, don't try to get something for yourself and stir up something in somebody else. Don't try to stir up a desire in somebody else that's not godly, that would cause them to be humiliated or destroyed in any way. He says, do not, that's verse six, don't take advantage. Why? 
because the Lord's the avenger. You say, how can you take advantage? Hey, you don't have to take advantage by rape or molestation. There's a lot of that going on. But you can take advantage by somebody the way you look at them, young lady, young man. You can take advantage of them by the way you dress. Simple principle, if there's cleavage, leavage. <laughs> Pull it up. I'm not interested in seeing the parting. Come on. Parents, where are you? There are certain ways and things, the way a God made a woman that are attractive to a man for a reason so that man and that woman can enjoy their relationship. But heaven forbid, they're not for everybody else in the community. The short skirts, the tight pants that look like they were painted on when you were born and still shrinking. The short shorts that you're falling out of in the back, come on. Ladies. Young ladies, don't dress like hookers and prostitutes. Well, I happen to think she looks very cute in it. I'm sure a lot of the guys think so too. We're living in a wicked generation. Put your head on straight. Bible says very clearly not to defraud one another. Unfortunately, we have little girls today who think, well, I'm just not pretty enough. I've got to do something to draw some more attention. You've been lied to by a wicked and godless generation. The attention you get is not going to be genuine, nor is it going to be real. It's going to be, looking, it's going to be that person who wants to defraud you, to have you for their own advantage, to take advantage of you. Now, there's a lot we could say here, all right? But that's pretty clear, all right? Just that you shouldn't walk around like a cow on an auction block. All right? God gave you what he gave you, young man, young lady, for your wife, for your husband one day. Have a gift to give. There's this idea, you know, of, 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 of the value of our life, that you start giving it away when it's not supposed to be given, and it's, and it's not supposed to be, you know, it, it literally takes the potency out of your life. Whereas virtue brings potency to your life, power to your life. Dissolution is the word we would use today. It just, it just takes away the strength, the energy, the vitality of your life. And the Bible makes this lesson clear over and over and over again. Why could David walk up to that front line? Why could Shadrach, Meshach, Abed, uh, Daniel, by the way, young men filled with virtue? They wouldn't compromise because something was popular, acceptable. The last thing he deals with is the penalty. And I don't have time to go into all this, but here's what he says in Scripture. For God didn't call us to uncleanness. He's not talking about having dirty feet. He's talking about a dirty life, morality, but unto holiness. Therefore, if you despise, you don't despise man, you're despising God who's given to you the Holy Spirit. He says, don't reject this word. And it literally means to treat something lightly or to scoff at it. Oh, that's just old stuff, man. Pastor, everybody's doing this now. I mean, it's just everybody's doing it. I mean, he says, hey, don't despise the word of God. There's a lot of penalty to it. One, you have to face the psychological penalties. Those things where people who get involved in these particular kinds of sin have now opened the door to all kinds of other temptations in their life. They're having problems. You know, they, there's depression and clinical psychologists and psychiatrists tell us that young people who are actively involved in this kind of immorality in their life and pornography and these kind of sins are opened up, they open up their life to lots of depressing a depression is not just girls, it's young men as well. And I would say we can deal with some of these other things later on, but there are other, not just are there mental and emotional scars, there's physical scars. We, we talk about all the sexual diseases that are out there and all the complication it brings from the cervical cancer. And, you know, Governor Perry, bless his heart, but how stupid was it to start handing out this particular vaccine that he wanted to give little junior high girls? Why was he, well, it's, 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 cervical cancer is a bad thing. Where do you get cervical cancer from? You get cervical cancer, young ladies, from premarital sex. That's what causes cervical cancer. Look it up if you don't believe me, all right? And then there's, not, I'll, I'll, you deal with those issues of all those kind of things, and the, psych, the physical STDs and AIDS and all those other things that are out there, but there's also spiritual scars, you know? God wants to bring you to a special place in life. He doesn't want you to go into life guilt-ridden and shamed, living in heartache and pain and condemnation. God wants you to walk in freedom. That's why the Bible says, don't let us commit fornication as some of those people committed in the wilderness. And they all died. One day, 23,000 people died because they were living in immorality. God just opened the ground and swallowed them up. He may not open the ground and swallow up, but you may wish he had because of all the pain and all the heartache. 
I'd, I'd like every person, every parent in this room to go take Proverbs 5 and 6 and 7 and read it to your children. Read it more than once. Read it several times. In those chapters of Proverbs, he deals with the high cost of immorality. Let me just run them through for you very quick. He said in Proverbs chapter 5, he talks about a wasted life because he, he chose to live in immorality. Proverbs 5.10, he talks about coming to financial ruin because you chose to live in immorality. 5.11, he talks about all the mental anguish we talked about a while ago. The, the self-reproach in, in 12 and 13. In Proverbs 5.21, the divine displeasure. He goes on in Proverbs 5.22. He deals with the, the enslavement that comes in your life. Listen, you can tell a person who's being demonized in their life because they've opened themselves up to immorality and Satan loves that and embraces that in a person's life because it gives him a foothold in their life. Proverbs 5.23 talks about a ruined life. You get into Proverbs chapter 6, there's a whole bunch, but one of the key points there is a damaged reputation. 6.34 and 35, he talks about revenge from a father or a husband or someone like that that you're going to have to face one day. And in Proverbs 7.22, he talks about one day when you think you're getting away with it, it's like a bird being led, following breadcrumbs into a trap. You're going to find yourself destroyed. Galatians 6 and 7, I'll wrap it up with this. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever man soweth, that will he also reap. You want to play that kind of game? You want to live that kind of life of immorality? There's a price to pay. And it's going to cost you a lot more than you want to pay. And it's going to cost you a lot longer than you want to pay. Inside, you're going to hurt. Inside, you're going to feel the pain. Not only that, we do not live as islands, ladies and gentlemen. What I do affects what my children will do. My wife will end up doing. You say, well, I don't know what happened to my kids. They're like you. And they become like you. Because you thought you could do these things in secret that no one would know and no one would be aware. Now, I praise God. You know, every time I preach these kind of messages, and y'all know I wrote a book years ago called Love, Lust, or Romance. It's no longer in print. You can probably buy it on eBay. I've seen it there before. It costs you more than what I charge people for them. But <laughs> the book had to do with this whole issue, that there is a God of grace. And every time I've preached on these issues and talked about these issues from adults to young people, I see pay, people's face just kind of fall because they know exactly what I'm talking about. They know exactly where, where, where we are. And many of them say, Joe, that was my life. That was a testimony of my life. And I'm so sorry I threw away those years or those days or those months of my life. I'm sorry. I made a wreck of it. But I want you to know I discovered Jesus and I realized that he loved me more than any man or any woman ever could. And I realized that he received me in spite of everything I've done. And I took a look at the cross of Christ where real love and sacrifice came from. And I embraced his forgiveness and his acceptance of me just as I am. There is forgiveness. The young people, listen carefully. No matter what this world says about virginity, it's a very special gift. There is no second virginity. I heard someone teaching on that one day. I was at a conference. So there's a second virginity. I, didn't, I, I had to say something. There's no second virginity. It's a physical gift that you have. Save it for that moment. It's an honorable gift of merit for marriage. Don't let the world compress you and clone you and make you like they are. Present your body a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable. This is your reasonable service in Christ. And God says he'll renew your mind by his word and by his spirit. Would you stand with your heads bowed? <clears throat> Father, I thank you.